Hi everyone, I'm Anjali Singhi. I'm a visual journalist at the New York Times. And I'm Yulia Barshinakotas. I'm also a visual journalist at the New York Times in the graphics department. Uh, today we're going to talk about how we reconstructed the Greenwood neighborhood destroyed by the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, so the interactive article was published in May, right before the centennial anniversary of the massacre. It was, uh, it was a tremendous effort. Over 20 people touched the project in some way. Yulia and I read the reporting for the piece and we were joined by uh, reporter Audra Birch, whose subject matter expertise led the writing of the piece. Uh, Greenwood was a thriving self-sufficient community of black residents that was burned down completely by the white mob a hundred years ago. Hundreds were killed, uh, were thousands of homes destroyed and looted. And we tried to recreate the neighborhood and what was lost in the massacre using maps and archival materials. And the way the story is typically covered is through, you know, very powerful photographs and other archival materials like newspapers. But uh, just based on our backgrounds working with 3D and architecture and geospatial materials and, you know, just reading through the story and understanding how it unfolded, we felt that it should really be thought about it more spatially. So we wanted to really get into the, into, into the, way that the neighborhood was into the city and uh, laid out in a more geospatial way. Uh, like Julia said, we started out by trying to understand the geography of Greenwood, especially in relation to the rest of Tulsa. Uh, it was a predominantly African-American neighborhood of about 10,000 residents um, in the northern part of Tulsa City in Oklahoma. Uh, it was important to understand the significance of spatial elements like the, the railroads known as the Frisco tracks um, that essentially separated the, the neighborhood from predominantly white neighborhoods. And so from the beginning, we tried to focus on these kind of spatial details to tell the story of Greenwood. Next, we wanted to visualize the Greenwood neighborhood um, and Tulsa City as it looked like in 1921 when the massacre took place. And in order to recreate it, we needed a map of Greenwood from 1921. We started to look at a lot of the archival materials online for Tulsa and Greenwood before 1921. And this was one of the first things we found in our reporting. Um, it's a hand-drawn aerial illustration from 1918 from uh, the Library of Congress. It captured just a little bit of Greenwood in the illustration and even though it was not fully in the view. Uh, it gave us a sense of the built up and the street character and what that was like, especially for the one block that we profiled in our story. Some other maps we found were these handmade maps of street grids and districts from 1919 and 1921 that gave, that gave us a good sense of the, the street grids uh, at the time. And they were scanned hard copy maps of Tulsa that we found in the archives of libraries like the Tulsa City County Library. And as we compared some of these maps, we found that there were constant street name changes as well as uh, the neighborhood um, as the neighborhood developed. So that was one of the things um, that we tried to keep track of, of all the street name changes and references in a spreadsheet so we could find a street by an older name and a reporting um, and we'd know that they were actually talking about this other street that's relevant for our purpose. But none of these maps had building footprints and in order to create the city and the neighborhood, we needed that. Um, and we found uh, scans of 1915 Sanborn insurance maps uh, of Tulsa uh, that were available to download in high resolution as tips from Library of Congress. Uh, as you can see, these were broken up in different smaller parts of the city. Uh, but we learned that from, from the census data, uh, we learned that the population of Tulsa nearly quadrupled between 1910 and 1920. So we, in order to act accurately recreate Greenwood, we needed a map of footprints uh, that was more uh, close to 1921. 
So Yulia then found this blog that had an image of a map scan um, from 1920 Sanborn, and we got really excited. It was being exhibited at the Tulsa Historical Society Museum in Tulsa. Uh, we reached out to them and we worked with their archivist, Luke Williams, who was uh, extremely helpful and generous and sent us scanned high-res copies of the 1920 Sanborn map. Um, once we had those scans of the 1920 map, we wanted to turn it into a 3D city. And to start with, we cleaned up the maps in Photoshop and stitched them together to create a wider map that we could um, georeference. And we ran into, uh, this is just an example of some of the issues we ran into while georeferencing streets from 100 years ago that did not exist anymore. So we had to use references um, that did exist and use, it was a lot of hit and trial to get it to align as accurately as possible with uh, present day geometry. Another issue we ran into was the, the file size since the scans were really high res and there were a lot of them. Um, and we realized that instead of manually stitching all the scans together and then georeferencing it, it might be better to just georeference individual scans. My colleagues, Tim and Jigal, who worked on the georeferencing, first trimmed and then downsampled the full scans, then georeferenced them separately and exported a big geotiff, uh, which we then cleaned up in Photoshop, as you can see in the image on the right. Uh, we then used this uh, tool in Photoshop, it's an add-on called Geographic Imager, uh, to, that lets you retain geographic information, so then when you export the clean image from Photoshop, it can, it's still georeference and we can use it in QGIS. And then we worked with our colleague Ling Dang Huan, who brilliantly created an algorithm and fed it a lot of information to train it to recognize the building footprints in the Sanborn maps themselves and differentiate them from block outlines, roads, or any kind of scratches or other values that are present on the map. He was able to train this algorithm to recognize the footprints and then to extract them into 3D blocks of similar heights. And this is one of the examples of the algorithm learning and starting to recognize. Uh, we also attempted uh, for the algorithm or LinkedIn attempted for the algorithm to learn to recognize the block outlines so we could create cleaner streets, but it proved to be a challenge and that had to be done manually in the end. And you know, when, when the geometry got extracted, it was uh, all um, of a similar height, but we were able to glean um, floor um, information in the maps, in the Sanborn maps. Uh, they were indicated on the long sides of the buildings by numbers um, in feet. And we were able to, LinkedIn created another piece of uh, software, another tool where we could manually enter these values for each building throughout the city so that the city could look as it, as it probably did at the time. We then manipulated um, this 3D geometry or manipulated the cameras around the 3D geometry of the city in a 3D editor, editor called Maya where we could create cameras and fly through the neighborhood and style it um, in the way that we would want to present it. We were also able to bring the, the maps as textures in the in Maya in the 3D editor to have that reference for streets um, when we did the as we did the animations. This is what the final uh, product looked like for the wider city in Greenwood and some of the businesses in Greenwood and the rest of Tulsa. Uh, we also mapped a lot of data. Uh, one of the best resources we found while reporting on the piece was the Tulsa city, count, uh, city directory from 1921 that was uh, digitized by Tulsa City County Library. And we downloaded those scans from the website, cleaned them, and ran OCR to get a data set of businesses and addresses uh, for Greenwood in 1921. And then we filtered any entry with a C in front of them. That meant that the business was owned by a Black resident. And my colleagues, Black and Allison, further cleaned that data manually after filtering so we could uh, map them. You can see on the left, uh, the businesses on the right, we 
try to map some of these. We also used data from Ancestry.com, census data from 1920 that um, for occupations, and then analyzed and mapped what uh, some of the occupations were held by residents in Greenwood. So we had this, you know, wealth of information about the neighborhood and the people who lived there, and we felt that to tell a story in a way that would really touch our readers, we needed to bring them closer to the ground level and really introduce them in a more personal way to the people who live there. We identified um, the one block where, for which luckily a few reference, visual references still remain, the 100 block on um, Greenwood Avenue as like this key block that had it all. It had some of the wealthiest residents who owned businesses uh, and lived in the kind of fancier part of Greenwood. It had more down to earth businesses like electricians and um, plumbers. It had doctors and lawyers. And it just seemed like a great example of a little bit of everything that Greenwood had to, had to offer at the time. So it's this one block that is the closest to the rail tr railroad tracks that divided the White Tulsa from the Black Tulsa. And um, we really dove deep into each of the, um, of the buildings on those blocks um, to really identify every single business that would have been there at the time. Um, and um, our colleagues, Gilbert Gates and Mika Grondahl, dug through any remaining uh, photographs that weren't destroyed in the fire that illustrated the pre-massacre um, pre Greenwood, but also looked at a lot of images of destruction to try to understand what the facades of the buildings looked like. We had the top-down view from the maps, but we really wanted to understand all the finer details of those buildings. And um, they, Mika Grondahl um, ended up modeling this kind of block, block and a half um, of Greenwood with as fine detail as you could find in those references, but no more than that. So there are parts of the street that are left untouched and uh, simpler if we were not able to find the visual references necessary to describe it. But he didn't, he didn't stop there. Uh, so this is actually a great example of one of the buildings. Um, it's the Williams build, uh, building built by the Williams family who we talk about in the story as one of the main characters. And those are some of the photographs he used to recreate them uh, in great detail. He didn't stop there. He, um, when, once he was done with the architecture, he went in and found these uh, wonderful details of cars, benches and lampposts, and even a trolley and meticulously modeled um, them in the 3D editor Maya to really bring this block to life. So once we had this block, we wanted to identify all the businesses and all the people who were involved in the daily life. Uh, we uh, were able to gauge the numbers of each house uh, and combine it to the visual references, but also starting out with the city directory data, we were able to kind of have an initial understanding of what businesses existed in each building. But then we went beyond the city directory uh, to really confirm what was there. So that's an example of the city directory data that Anjali already shared with you. But we also um, dug deeper and looked at the Tulsa Star, which was the newspaper um, owned and uh, operated by A.J. Smitherman um, that, that was the heart of the neighborhood. It um, did a lot of national coverage, but also covered a lot of minute details about the residents of the neighborhoods and their daily lives. Who went on vacation? Who did, you know, who got, you know, had an accident or who had a cold um, and were having a hard time recovering? And what this uh, newspaper also had that was of deep value to us was the colored business section where uh, residents um, of many businesses advertised with their address and a little bit like a snippet of information about what the business did. And so we combed through these pages over the years to both confirm the businesses that we knew in the city directory, uh, but also we ended up finding um, some new ones that we added to our list for that one block. Uh, it would have been impossible to do it for the whole neighborhood. Um, and so we were able to find a, a number of new businesses, but also some where the addresses you know, were, were hard to identify or there were differences between all the sources. This was yet another source where we 
confirm the address and help us paint a bigger picture. And uh, one of my favorite stories of searching through the newspaper, um, you know, besides the advertisements, there were also these very personal articles about the happenings of Greenwood. And um, there was this woman, Susie Bell, whose story uh, just was amazing. She was a female entrepreneur. She ran, um, you know, she was a beloved restaurateur in the neighborhood. Uh, we read a lot of little snippets about her, but it seemed that by the time, you know, fr from the city directory data, by the time the massacre came about, her restaurant moved off the block somewhere else. But as we were doing research, we stumbled across one article that described a business on our block closing and her restaurant moving back in. And we got so excited and started digging, digging through, through, you know, pages and pages of the newspaper and came across another article that mentioned that she did move in, in you know, 1920 of that year, which was fairly close, you know, as, as far as the records available to us, um, to, to the date we cared about. And so we were able um, through, you know, the sleuthing uh, through the newspaper to place her on the block. And it's one of the, I, at least my favorite stories um, of the people we profiled. Yeah, so, and, yeah, go ahead, Gloria. No, you go ahead. I was just saying that um, we wanted to show you some of the, the initial sketches we did for the storyboarding. Um, so a bunch of us used a lot of hand-drawn sketches to storyboard uh, what it might look like and how we can incorporate photos, videos, um, maps, 3D, and, and text. And it was a lot of thinking that went on to uh, the way that we would treat it in terms of color and just cinematography of it all, how the cameras would travel through this, you know, 3D stage uh, that we built and how the colors that we choose would reflect the narrative that we're telling. Um, for example, we stepped away from a black background early on um, through uh, the vision of Troy Griggs, who are directed and really styled the interaction for this piece. And uh, we ended up with this very, I, I think, beautiful and um, uh, very kind of calming background of this, this archival uh, page. So because we had so many different kinds of uh, visual material for the piece, we used many different tools for um, to produce a project and to report it. Um, I don't know if you're, you're running out of time, but these are just some of the, the tools we used. Google Docs sheets for organization, data analysis, uh, Autodesk Maya for 3D modeling animation, After Effects for a lot of motion graphics and HTML labels, um, QGIS and GDAL uh, and Geographic Imager for all the mapping stuff and, and a lot of uh, custom code to build the page. And I think that's it. Thank you, Thank you so much.